Good afternoon, everybody. It's really nice to be back with you this month. I hope uh, a few of you were here with us last month. Uh, we're going to talk about sleep and we're going to talk about stress uh, and kind of the impact that uh, stress has on our sleep as well. So uh, we're going to go on through this. Um, do you, you know, when you find that you're feeling like you're under stress, do you know because your body gives you certain signals? or what, uh, what happens for you when you're under stress? We have any, uh, any volunteers, anybody like to offer up? Can I talk? Hi, Christine. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> well, when I'm under stress, I don't sleep very well. I toss and turn. I get headaches uh -huh. and I'm an emotional eater if anybody else is in the same boat as me. <laughs> yeah, I am. I, uh, those things are all true. For me as well, I was awake a couple of nights ago. Um, I have a regular uh, day job. I'm an engineer for AT&T and I'm working on a very, very big project for the county of LA, which is the largest voting district in the United States in uh, support of the election with some technology. And I just was worrying about a particular thing we have to solve for. And I was awake from 1.30 to 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. thinking it over and, and stressing about it and thinking, how are we going to solve this? How do I design this? What does my team do? And uh, I don't know if I was much better off in the morning. I don't think I came up with a conclusion. And then what happens for me is when I do finally go back to sleep, then I'm in a deep, heavy sleep and it's harder to wake up because yeah. I've had a short night. Yeah, that happens, doesn't it? Um, also, we get a lot of physiological symptoms with stress. You mentioned headaches. I get those too. Um, I was saying earlier when we all dialed in that when I don't uh, drink enough water and I'm not hydrated enough, um, I get headaches from that. And in stressful situations, I keep making more coffee instead of drinking water uh, like I need to. So I definitely have a physical response to that. Um, I can tell when my body goes into fight or flight mode. I'm sure that's true for many of us. I do get that accelerated heartbeat. Uh, I get aware of it, right? Feeling it in my chest. I'll feel very anxious. Uh, and I end up needing to stop myself. I stop and do some deep breathing if I can. And I'm in a position where I can meditate for a few minutes. I rely on a couple of YouTube uh, videos for some sound meditation, and I will take the time out actually within my day to take a five or a 10 minute meditative break. And that really helps me. Sometimes just stopping to breathe for a couple of minutes really helps me sort of get refocused and get through whatever that sort of stress spike uh, was about. So we talked about a couple of these, the, the trouble with sleeping, um, finding myself short, uh, short-tempered, not having nearly the patience I normally have. I can definitely tell when I'm under stress and that's happening. Um, my husband remarked the other day that I'm, I'm working, as he put it, bell to bell. I'm working about 60 hours a week right now because of this big project. And I find that the little things that normally would happen during the day are, are just things I can't deal with, really irritating things like the dog barking when anyone approaches the front door, um, you know, just little things that normally I'd be very patient with and, and easy with. I find that they just really irritate me. And that's when I know I need to take a little stress break and do some breathing. Um, so what, uh, here's, a, here's a good suggestion. You know, the zebra is coloring and it's supposed to relieve stress. Uh, there are um, some scientific studies that prove when you get into a creative activity of any kind, you achieve something called flow. And flow takes your mind away from the other things that might be top of mind for you and puts you in kind of a meditative place. You're focusing on something you're doing. I like to sew and I like to do needlework. And I can sit down with um, a piece of needlework that I have in process and I'll get into flow pretty quickly and the rest of the world sort of tunes out for me. So um, those are things I do. I also do love to take my dog for a walk and that usually alleviates some stress as well. And I, I'll, I'll make little walk breaks happen during the day really and block my calendar in this so, that I can, so that I can get him out. So um, you have to find the things that, that will work for you if you're a creative person at all. 
find a creative activity that you can turn to in times of stress. And again, it, it shifts your brain's focus and puts you into that flow state. Um, we've all probably seen these stress balls over the years or stress balloons, but if you don't have one, there's just something you can do with your body physically. You can do it when sitting in a chair or you can also do it in bed at night. And that is to clench and unclench muscle groups. So tighten up your toes and your feet and then let them relax, clench all the muscles in your legs and then let them relax, clench your abdominal muscles and then let them relax, clench your arms, flex your bicep, hold that pose and then let it relax and then also clench your shoulder muscles up into your neck and then let those relax. And that really uh, releases some endorphins for us and helps us as well in terms of the physical responses to stress. So stress is, you know, that protective response, that uh, adrenal response of releasing uh, adrenaline and cortisol. And over time, if you've lived a, a life that's had a lot of stress in it, you end up with damage from that and you end up with an inability. The body gets conditioned to being hypersensitive to stress. Uh, we see this in children who have been abused and grow into adults, that they are, um, they are severely sensitive to stress triggers and just don't have the same tolerance or patience that you might expect. And you can look at them and say, wow, he or she really, that really set them off. And it's a trigger. It, it kind of triggers them back to that danger state. Uh, and that happens to all of us if we've lived a life that has had a lot of stress in it. So it's super important, you know, for us to each evaluate what are the things that are happening in our life that might be creating or causing stress for us, and then figure out what changes can I make to, you know, make this a less stressful event, a less stressful situation for myself, or what changes can I make in my perspective on how it impacts me uh, and, and managing my stress through healthier activities like exercise, prayer, meditation, things that uh, creative work, as I said, that put us into flow, things that move us away from that stress. Um, I remember once, I, and, and I'm not proud of this, I'll tell you this little story, I'm actually quite ashamed of it. We were parked down at uh, Cedar Point, we had taken our family for a, a Cedar Point fun day, and I was driving and I put, I thought, I didn't think there was anyone behind me, I don't know why I didn't double check all my mirrors, I put the car in reverse and I backed right into a car. And my first instinct was to drive away as fast as I could. Um, because it was that fight or flight response. And I guess I'm programmed for flight. I'd rather run than fight. <laughs> so I had to stop myself and say, what are you doing? And I had to write a note and put it on the windshield of the car because I had created damage on uh, the person that I had hit. And, you know, leave a note with my name and phone number and, and then take care of it uh, outside of that. But that was really revealing for me. And it made me make question, why is that your stress response? And what can you do potentially to recondition yourself um, so that that is not your response? A little stress gives us energy sometimes. It gives us motivation to, to get in there and deal with whatever the issue is that's causing us the stress. It, it can promote us to action, right? But long periods of stress for uh, time, over time, cause fatigue, apathy, we get that stress response stuck on where our adrenals are releasing too much of these chemicals in our body too regularly. Uh, and then that can result in a longer term depression as well. So it's really important if we're in a situation like this in our lives to just stop and think about it and seek help where we can get it. If it's therapy or counseling, whether it's pastoral or otherwise, um, just sometimes talking to a really close friend about a situation that's chronic, that's ongoing in your life can be helpful. Sometimes just having someone to listen to us uh, if we're in a situation that's causing us stress and to be able to air that out. We don't always necessarily want our problem solved, but we just want someone to be a good listener. I'm gonna stop before we move on because I need a sip of water, but I also wanted to stop and see if anyone uh, has any um, response to this? Have you found yourself in these conditions in your life? Uh, does this resonate for you in any way? <clears throat> Hi, Josetta. 
Hi, I wanted to say when you first asked, how do I know that I'm maybe in stressful times and modes or whatever, and I kind of was blank. I've, I've learned how to get through the sleep thing because I sure can identify with you, but I've been working on the sleep thing about four or five years now. So mm -hmm. but the one thing mm -hmm. you said that really, really hit me is that I become short tempered. So mm -hmm. that's a really good mm -hmm. flag now for me to know. What's yeah, that that's excellent. That's an excellent point. I can tell that in myself as well, because I'm generally a, uh, an excellent listener and a very patient person. And boy, when I find that I'm, I'm like restraining myself and I'm feeling irritated and agitated about something that I know I need to evaluate what my stressors are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point. Thank you. Well, Anybody what, else? I just wanted to say, because what happens is it comes out in a way that's probably someone closest to us who has nothing, mm -hmm. really nothing to do with what's going on with what's going on right right and we we sometimes you know those cartoon bubbles where the words are out and you can't pull them back right we want to take care not to do much of that especially with the people that are closest to us because they're our safety net right that's where we feel the safest and sometimes that's where we strike out a little bit so breathing is you know is really important as I talked about um, taking time to breathe out that stress you can just sit and close your eyes. Are you familiar uh, generally with the difference between chest breathing and belly breathing? Uh, I was a music student as a child. I learned to play an instrument and that's where we learned to belly breathe. And that's the use of your diaphragm, which is that muscle that sits right on top of your stomach between your stomach and your lungs. And so if you can sit in a chair and watch yourself uh, and take a deep breath and look and see whether you're chest and your shoulders are raising with that breath, uh, then try to take another deep breath and use your stomach, use your belly. Look at taking that breath slower and trying to make sure that you see your stomach expanding rather than your chest and your shoulders raising. It sounds a little abstract, but we actually have a really good muscle to help us do that, and that is that diaphragm. And if you can sit, and I like to close my eyes, and I like to sit without my legs crossed or anything. So in other words, all of my sort of body's electrical channels are open. The flow of electricity through my body is open. And this is true in meditation as well. And I'll just take those slow, deep breaths and let them out slowly. You can also do a count if you like. Count in and then try to equally count back out when you release that breath. And I'll try to think about something that's either a great memory or something that's coming up that I'm really looking forward to, like maybe spending time with my family uh, and get away from that moment in time where I'm feeling overwhelmed by the stress. And the breathing will seriously bring down your blood pressure. It will stop your heart from racing. It will slow it down and it will do so much for you physically that it's also doing so much for you health-wise. So that's just uh, something that you can do throughout the day when you feel overwhelmed by stress or feel um, something even resembling a panic attack coming on. So attitude really does make a difference. I've always said this, and we have another slide here in the deck. Uh, one of my favorite saying is, sayings is, where the brain goes, the heart follows. And so if we're thinking and dwelling on negativity and on things that are, you know, we're, we're just sort of worrying this issue, we're grudge festing on a particular issue that may have happened with a loved one or in uh, my case, maybe with a coworker and just really dwelling on it, then I, you know, it starts to become something when in fact, it's probably nothing. Maybe that individual was having a really bad day and you just happened to be in the way. So I think, uh, Trying to let go of those things is really important. Um, there's a meditation technique called loving kindness. And I am kind of perverse in that if someone's really upsetting me or irritating me, or I think being intentionally ugly to me, then I'll meditate on them and I'll send them some loving kindness. Now you may or may not believe in meditation. I happen to believe in it, it works for me. Uh, but I also know that when I do that, I get up from that meditation feeling so much better 
feeling calmer and feeling like I can let that incident go and just walk away from it. Also, age has helped me with that as well. I'm not as uh, impetuous, you know, as I'm aging and I've learned through life that it often isn't personal. Sometimes it is, and then you have to go deal with that with that individual, but most of the time it isn't, and it's just not worth carrying the resentment, right? When we, when we harbor a resentment for someone, I feel like all we are doing is hurting ourselves because they're probably completely unaware that we're harboring that, um, that grief over that interaction with them. Um, and so this is kind of similar to my saying where the brain uh, where the brain goes, the body follows. And I, you know, for me, it's really where the brain, uh, where the brain dwells, the heart follows. Um, and I think this is true in, in terms of relationships with our loved ones. Sometimes if we have distance with a sibling or an aunt, uncle, cousin, brother, sister, mother, father, whatever, I always try to step back from it and think about how I'm thinking about this thing. Can I change my thinking? Can I influence my thinking? Can I draw back to what it is that I know I love and care for in that individual and make that the forefront of my thinking instead of whatever the issue or the resentment might have been about? So we have uh, something called response and ability, right? And we've probably seen loved ones or friends in relationships where we've remarked sort of to ourselves, wow, that's really codependent. Uh, he or she has really got to step away from that, right? Sometimes it's very difficult to do so, depending on the nature of that relationship. So, um, so I think, again, that's coming back to a place for me where I have to evaluate why I'm feeling a certain way. Why am I allowing that to continue? Um, is it time for me to step away? I've had a couple of friendships over the years uh, that I've just simply had to end because I came to the conclusion that they were really codependent friendships and that we weren't good for one another, that we were actually bringing each other down. Um, and that uh, if I couldn't change my perspective on that, then it was time to move away, that the season for that friendship was over. So um, you have to assess that emotional investment. Is it toxic? What is it costing you? Um, you know, you can't always fix everything for the people that you love. And sometimes you have to evaluate whether you need to put some distance in. Again, this is back to what could be some of the causes of those stresses in our lives. So uh, we've talked about some stress reducers and uh, I'll run through the list, but then I'd like to hear from everybody and open it back up again. Uh, exercise, I talked about that. Walking is really good for me. Um, I also try to get other exercise in, but uh, with the busyness that's going on in my life right now, walking is about the only thing I'm uh, making time for. A warm drink, that's really not been my thing, although I do enjoy making a nice cup of tea and relaxing with it. Uh, music can de-stress me very much. It's also kind of a, a thing that puts me into a meditative state. Now it's got to be the right kind of music to do that. Uh, I have a Google uh, electronic assistant, digital assistant, and so I'll say, hey Google, play instrumental study music. And when Google finds me a, a playlist of instrumental study music, it's really peaceful and calming. And it's typically classical. Uh, but it really um, helps me to just sit and listen to that for a while. And sometimes I, I get in the habit of just having the TV on for company or noise all the time. So I'm trying to shut it off and do more of that, having the music on for that companionship or noise in the room um, at, that, at that more soothing level than the TV, which is sort of jarring and jangling most of the time. Socializing can be a great stress reducer as well. I don't know about you all, but I uh, really look forward to any um, family events or the opportunity to connect. I have my children are out of the house, they're grown. So I really look forward to that. And this year, COVID, this year of COVID has been very hard on us with all of that. Um, my husband and I decided that we really love to go out to dinner. And the fact that we couldn't for so long just was bothering us, was just really um, eating away at us. And we have enjoyed um, safely and socially distanced being able to go back out and uh, order off a menu and have the care and the service that you get in that environment. It, may, it It's not only a social event, but it takes us out of our home where we've spent so much time, right? So we're enjoying that again. 
I'm a big fan of meditation. I do it regularly. I'm also um, uh, very spiritual. And so my meditation ends up being a combination of prayer and meditation when I do it. So uh, what do we have to avoid? We have to avoid drugs, alcohol, too much solitude that allows us to dwell on our issues. Um, and then other things that are, you know, that are stimulants. Um, and then lastly, and I want to open it up, laughing is great because uh, being amused, laughing releases endorphins in our system, uh, similar, similarly to how chocolate can reduce uh, or release endorphins rather, similarly to, uh, pardon the expression, to great sex releases endorphins in our system. So uh, if you don't have chocolate or great sex available, then go find something that's going to make you laugh. And I hope I made you laugh a little bit there too. So let me uh, stop and open it back up for some comments on what are some of the things that you all do to reduce your stress. I think you mentioned um, breathing. I do that four square breathing and you're counting in for four, you're holding it for four seconds and then you breathe it out slowly for a count of eight. So that really helps me when I'm, when I'm feeling really tense, I, I just think to myself, I gotta slow down here. Yeah, that's great, Judith. I hadn't heard of the four square, but that's a great way to do it, to hold that in and then count that back out slowly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Josetta, I think has a question. You no, know, I just wanted to say that one of the things that I like to do is I've tr I traveled a lot and I take a lot of photos and I have learned that if I just, you know, hit on mine, they're organized, I have an Apple computer and just start looking at the photos from whatever and it brings back all the good feelings. I can physically see it, feel a difference of um, what I had at that time. And, you know, usually, even if they're family photos, very seldom do we take photos of something that well maybe at a funeral event now people but other than that usually they're fun events there's something that has good memories mm -hmm. so looking at photos for me is just a just a really pleasant way to get away and then the other thing is music and especially music from the 50s for me Make, oh yeah yeah just amazing how much that just puts me in a different place yeah, well, one, one other kind of music that I really love, I grew up, um, I was born in the late 50s, so I was a, a child in the 60s, and my granddad ran a pool hall, and we all know what a pool hall is, right? Billiards, tables, and beer, and my dad would go there after work. My dad worked on uh, worked construction, building houses, and my dad would sometimes pick me up and take me over to the pool hall, where I heard all this great honky-tonk music, yeah. and uh, country music, you know, classic country from the early 60s. I love that music. I love Ray Price. I love to be outside gardening and pick something yeah. like that to listen to on my, um, on my phone, on my music. And it just puts me in a completely different space. Plus, it brings back great memories. Although having a little girl in a pool hall may not have been advised, but <laughs> they used to sit me up at the uh, cash register on the counter and give me a tiny bottle of Coke. And my granddad would keep an eye on me up there. So <laughs> great memory. I love what you said about your pictures, Josetta, because music is, for me, music is evocative of those memories as well. And I, I love that um, era of music for that same reason. Um, All right. Anybody else? Oh, yeah. I think Marie has a comment. Yeah, music, go ahead, Marie. Music and spirituality have a, a, a good, uh, give me good relief, as well as sometimes just picking up something in reading. Uh, I can focus on what I'm reading, uh, reading rather than what's going on in my head, uh, making yeah. me stressed. So those are some of the things that I do. Yeah, those are great points. And reading, similarly to, uh, as I mentioned earlier, doing a creative activity, reading can put you in that flow state as well, where your brain has been diverted, right, to focus on the reading and the story and sort of imagining yourself in the story as you're reading. So uh, I'm a big reader as well. I love to read. My children gave me a membership to Book of the Month Club for Mother's Day this year, and I'm just loving it. Uh, and then I'm also in a virtual book club with some women that I went to high school with, 
and it's a lot of fun. It keeps us connected. Um, we're doing it over Zoom as well, and we're, we're just having a great time with it. So, um, Marie, you mentioned spirituality, and I think spirituality is probably different for a lot of us. You know, we may have different beliefs, but um, I think uh, spirituality is certainly an important aspect of my life. That's been my experience. It grounds me. It brings me back to center. Uh, and even though my beliefs have morphed quite a lot from how I was raised, that's not good or bad. That's just the, the uh, way that I've evolved and my life has evolved connecting to that is really important to me. Uh, being able to send out that loving kindness, and those are really meditative prayers for people uh, that, that are not necessarily on my uh, favorite list. Uh, that kind of is, is taking me in through a forgiveness cycle when I do that, uh, and I recognize that. And there are certainly um, favorite parts for me of the Bible that I turn to. Um, when I need to be comforted and when, I, when I'm feeling anxious. Uh, and this has been a year of anxiety for so many of us. So um, finding and nurturing that spirit, your essence, whatever that is. A lot of people practice yoga uh, or Tai Chi. Tai Chi is also a very meditative practice and it's also great for building balance as we age as well. Uh, prayers can be to uh, whomever you believe in, God or a higher power, or they can simply be meditative conversations with, with ourselves or with the universe. Uh, I think, um, you know, there are studies that show daily prayer can strengthen the immune system, shorten a hospital stay. Certainly, there have been instances in my life where loved ones have recovered from something that just defies medicine, right? And you just know that it's been the power of prayer that's gotten them there. Um, and then there have been other instances where that wasn't the case. So, but regardless, I still remain, um, you know, solid in my beliefs and I come back to center when I need to. Uh, and then there's also evidence that weekly attendance at religious services adds two to three years uh, to our lives. And um, that's really inspiring and hopeful as well. I've been watching um, my church service uh, online on Facebook Live, but for the summer, they set up bleachers and set up an outdoor church service as well. So I think we just have to find what works for us and whatever uh, that vein of spirituality is for you. Uh, this is a wonderful year to nurture it and let it be a place that you land that is a safe landing spot for you. I've talked a lot about meditation and by no means am I any kind of an expert on meditation. A lot of people will say, I can't, I can't meditate. I just can't do it. Right. Um, all I can do is sit there and think about how my nose itches or how I have this random pain in my calf. And that is the brain, you know, drawing your attention away from your breathing and from what you're there to do, finding these other things. I'll tell you a funny story. We were in, um, uh, Arizona, Scottsdale, Arizona last year for the Thanksgiving holiday. My dad lives out there and I uh, go to see him several times a year uh, and also always at one of the holidays. And we would like to do a little resort staying while we're out there. So we we're staying at a really lovely resort and they were offering a sound bowl meditation one morning while we were staying there. So uh, my husband, my daughter, and I were out there and my best friend had come in from Palm Springs to stay as well. So uh, the four of us, I was going to sign the three of us ladies up for the sound bowl meditation. And my husband said, Hey, what the heck I'm gain. I'll give it a try. And it was an hour long meditation on the floor with uh, wonderful warm blankets over you and Tibetan sound bowls uh, that sing. They're called singing bowls being played for that hour and some instruction and some chanting and a lovely close your eyes. And I went in there with a bad headache and I came out of there with no headache after that hour. My husband, who is so funny uh, and who is not ever going to be a meditator, uh, we're walking out and I said, well, what did you think about that? And he said, honestly, that's an hour of my life I'll never have back. And we all started laughing. So meditation is, is I told him, I said, we threw you in the deep end of the pool without any instruction and without a float. So I'm not surprised that's how you felt. It, it is something that you build over time. That's why it's called a practice, just like yoga is called a practice. You have to practice at it. Uh, it can become easier over time. There are apps that are out there for our smartphones. Calm is a great breathing meditative app 
and I believe it's free, or at least there are portions of it that are free. Uh, there are other meditation apps that are out there that will guide you through a meditation for five or 10 minutes. And that's how I started. I found some apps because I thought I just can't do this by myself. I need a voice in my ear um, helping me understand how to bring focus to this, how to get the benefit uh, of focusing on my breathing, breathing correctly. Um, and then I've gone on from there and, and practiced other um, things like loving kindness that I already mentioned uh, in my meditation. So there's a lot of science on meditation and how good it is for the brain. It's really good for a healthy brain. So, um, so this is a little, um, let's try it for just a moment or two exercise. I'm gonna watch my watch for a minute. And I'm going to ask everyone to remain quiet and close your eyes if you would and just do some breathing. Maybe we'll try the four square breathing um, and just think about your breath. Focus on your breath. Bring it in slow. Hold it. Let it out slow. And I'm going to start us right now for one minute. All right, I'll ask you to open your eyes and come back to the moment. And I'm curious if anyone had any sensations during that minute or if you were paying attention to how many breaths you took in and exhaled in that minute. I personally did about four, which means they were long, deep breaths with a pretty good hold before I let them back out again. Anybody else have any comments on that? I did feel more relaxed as soon as I started yeah. breathing. Yeah. It does it immediately. It's like an immediate fix. Mm -hmm. I was going to make the same comment. Um, Great. Great. Thank you. I hope, uh, I hope that little mini meditation was good for everybody. So, now we're going to uh, bring a little focus to our brain here and think quickly, and I hope everyone will unmute. Uh, can you name animals that are only three letters long? And I'll say that um, things that are uh, related to animals like bugs are allowed as well. Elk. What was that? Elk? Elk. Yeah. <laughs> Rat. Uh -huh. Rat. 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 Yak. 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 Good. So elk, elk, owl, bug, ant, ant, yep, boa, dog, cat, yes, mm hmm, great. Uh, and then I, I, mm -hmm. thought, I thought of a funny one just because of the, um, the Liberty Mutual com commercials that are on all the time, emu. This oh, yeah. morning when I was looking back at the slides, I was like, oh, I've got the first one. It's Emu. So, <laughs> because those commercials are so top of mind all the time. Yeah. Great. That was good. So we already did the relaxation. So I'm going to take us on into really talking about sleep now. Um, we really need, and I'm amazed when people tell me, oh, I've trained myself to sleep on five hours a night. Um, that's how I live my life. And I think to myself, oh my gosh, I wish I could just wrap you in a sleep hug for three more hours because you don't know what you're doing to your brain. You are not giving it enough rest. Even if you think you're operating well during the day, you're damaging your brain by cutting the sleep so short. 
I have two next door neighbors, one on either side of me. My, the gentleman next door to me on my left tells me that um, he can only sleep about four hours a night. And, uh, you know, and I always say, gosh, Doug, I really wish you could find a way to get more sleep. And then the lady next to me on the other side tells me she can only sleep about five hours a night. And I'm normally not a huge fan of uh, medication, but this is an area where I would say, you know, please go talk to your doctor about a sleep aid to allow your body to be in that sleep state long enough so that your brain can do the work that it needs to do. And we're going to talk about that work in a moment. We touched on it a little bit last month as well. Um, we need seven to nine hours a night. It's just, uh, there's just no arguing with it. We need that much sleep. And as we age, sleep is lighter, uh, it's less restorative, and it's more difficult to get those deeper sleeps. Although in some cases, some elders are sleeping longer. My dad is now uh, about to turn 87, and he is sleeping, I would say, 9, 10, maybe even 11 hours a night. In fact, he's uh, concerned about it and thinks he should get up earlier. And I told him that's ridiculous sleep as much as you want to, your body's telling you something. Uh, so there are two kinds of sleep, really. There, um, uh, there's the REM, the rapid eye movement. I think everyone's very familiar with that. That is when our brains are most active for dreaming. And that is when our brains organize our memories and our experiences of the day. So REM is very important for that memory retention and that memory categorization. Uh, when we talk next month about memory, we'll talk about the regions of the brain, uh, things like the hippocampus and why that's so important. But we've got to get that REM sleep. Non-REM or slow wave sleep, there are actually really two kinds of states of that. There's a lighter sleep and then there's a deep heavy sleep. Uh, and the deep heavy sleep is the one that slows our heart rate down. It lowers our blood pressure and that's when tissues mend. So if we have any insult or injury in our bodies. Uh, things like infections that we're fighting, a cut, a scrape, um, you know, anything that would cause an inflammation state in our bodies. That deep sleep at night is when the tissues try to mend themselves. Uh, and the brain does it as well. We'll talk a little bit about that. So these, these REM and deep sleep cycles happen in cycles. And a full sleep cycle runs about 90 minutes. So you can see why we want to try to get seven to nine hours, right? Um, you get 65 minutes or so of non-REM sleep. The body moves very little. Uh, then you get about 20 minutes of REM uh, in that 90-minute cycle and five minutes of non-REM, which would be the lighter sleep that's in between. It's a transitional sleep state between the deep sleep and the REM sleep. And we go through several of these cycles every night. Uh, I wear um, a wearable, which is a digital device that monitors my sleep. I talked about it last month, and it shows me a graphic every morning of what my sleep was like the previous night. So I can see, and it calculates how much REM I got, how much light sleep I got, and how much deep sleep I got. And it turns out we spend about four hours or so in light sleep in those transitioning stages throughout the course of the night, and the rest of the time is in the REM and the deep um, we, as I said, we go through several of these cycles each night. I see it on my wearable. I see about four or five of them happening at night. I also have become a big fan of napping during the day. Um, I like to around 3.30 if I can. Um, I block my calendars, my little work secret uh, for a half an hour. And I like to take a little power nap with my dog and uh, get up from that. And then I have a cup of decaf espresso and keep working. So that really seems to work for me. I feel good after I've had that little short nap. The days that I don't get them, I do feel a difference in my performance and in how my brain feels. Uh, if you need a rejuvenative, rejuvenative sleep, you need to get an hour or more for that to be cognitively rejuvenating. Uh, but these little power naps throughout the day can be really helpful. So just pushing back in a chair, taking a 10 or 15 minute nap. Um, it's usually pretty easy uh, for me to do that. It's not always easy for everybody. I think you sort of have to nap train and learn how to uh, take naps again if you, if you aren't doing that as an adult. So 
Learning and memory are critically impacted by good sleep or not good sleep. So we talked about it a bit last month. Like I say, we'll talk about it more next month. But the short version of this is if you get that REM sleep that you need at night throughout those sleep cycles, you'll have these nice, organized, categorized memories, like the books on the library shelves here. You don't get that REM sleep. You have a bad night's sleep. Your hippocampus can't sort this stuff out. That's the time it does it in that REM cycle. So it can't sort it out. It's a jumble. And we, uh, we know, in, you know with our loved ones who are um, experiencing dementia that sleep is difficult for them. And the sad truth of that is that that is uh, making the dementia worse. So not being able to get a good night's sleep. And this is where I would say to anyone that I you know, spoke with, talk to your doctor, see about a sleep aid. Again, because that four hours a night, like my neighbor is getting, is not enough. And I worry very much about his health, his cognitive health as he continues to age. Um, you know, whether or not uh, he will start to experience um, extra memory loss, extra memory issues, and potentially even moving on into dementia as he gets older. The reason we need the deep sleep is that this is when the brain cleanses itself. Uh, and actually, in studies, people have been wired up uh, for scans while they're sleeping, and the brain tissue contracts. It actually contracts, and the fluids wash through the brain. It's kind of like the dishwasher. I call it the dishwasher effect, right? Um, those fluids are washing through the brain, and they're trying to pull out poisons and bad proteins, which are toxins, to the brain. And we know that we have two bad proteins that contribute to Alzheimer's. They're beta amyloid and tau. And yeah. so if we get, are getting that nice deep sleep at night, then we're hopeful that those toxins are being pulled out in that fluid and that fluid is being flushed down through our spinal column, cleansed and gotten rid of. But again, that's back to needing that cycle of deep sleep. It's just as important as the REM, but for a different reason. So let's talk a little bit now about how to sleep better at night. Uh, we live in a northern climate here in Michigan, and we don't get enough sunshine. Plus, we're cautioned from getting almost any, right, based on uh, the risk of skin cancer. And so we've become a very sun avoidant society. And I've spoken with my doctor about this, and I've spoken with my dermatologist about it both, because every time I blood test, my vitamin D is insufficient. It's, it's either at the very low end of the range or it's right below the range. So my doctor has me on vitamin D supplements, right? So I take them every day, but I talked to my dermatologist about it and I said, and I'm fair skinned, I, you know, I have white hair now, but it used to be red and I have white skin. And I said to my dermatologist, I really want to absorb my vitamin D naturally. Can I spend 20 minutes in the sun before I put on sunscreen? And she said, you can but you need to watch that it's only 20 minutes. And so that's what I do. I garden, I'm out in the yard, I do, I'm doing work on my deck. Now this is just my approach for me. You have to figure out what works for you and please talk to your medical professionals about it because by no means am I saying avoid sunscreen, but sunscreen does block a lot of the good rays that we need from the sun that synthesize vitamin D naturally in our bloodstream and in our cells. And as we age, guess what happens? Here's, an, here's another bad trick of aging. Vitamin D synthesis slows down as we age. So it's even more difficult to make sure that we're getting the vitamin D and that we're getting the effect from it for our health and our bloodstream. And when we have low vitamin D, we have um, insult to the brain. The brain needs to rely on good vitamin D in our bloodstream and in our bodies. So vitamin D is a really critical element, and that's why doctors are blood testing for it. Um, so, you know, here's our recommendation. Get some sunshine each day. Try to get a little bit. Even if you just go out and sit for five minutes and turn your face up toward the sun, you're going to take in some sunshine and stimulate that synthesis of vitamin D. Eat a lighter dinner. Avoid fats. Um, lots of different advice around when you should, you know, stop eating before bedtime, um, two, three hours 
certainly because the body is working on digestion, uh, which means that the muscles are sending and the organs are sending blood and nutrients and everything to the stomach and to the intestines, and you're keeping your body working, which might mean it's more difficult for it to relax. Turn off the blue screen at least two hours before bedtime. Uh, I am so light sensitive that even in our bedroom where we do have a television, there's a cable box with a bright blue light on it. I have to put a little um, statue or tchotchke in front of it because I feel like that blue light is piercing my eyeball. When I try to go to sleep and close my eyes, I can sense that it's still running and that it's bothering me. So I cover it up at night. Exercise, but end at least three hours before bedtime because you've uh, elevated your heart rate and all of the effects that come along with that. Avoid caffeine, it says including chocolate. Chocolate does have caffeine in it uh, after 3 p.m. I'm probably not very good about that. I'd probably draw the line at more like 7 or 8 p.m., so I probably need to look at that. Uh, limit beverages three hours before bedtime because our bladder will uh, wake us up at night if we don't. Um, and then regulate your bedtime and your awakening time. Try to be in a routine as much as you can because the body craves that and our um, centralized systems in the body that regulate our wake and sleep cycles really desire us to be consistent about that. That's why when we travel uh, you know, across time zones or to other countries, uh, jet lag is such a real thing, a real thing that makes us feel sick. And then try to have a dark, quiet, cool bedroom. My husband and I always debate the temperature. I think I finally brought him around to my way of thinking. I like a cool room and we have skylights. So we'll open them up at night and all the way up into just about winter, right? To keep the room cool. Um, and I love that feeling of cool air in my bedroom and not hot oppressive air in my bedroom. So you can also do some things to provide some sensory calming uh, as you prepare to go to bed at night. Lavender is a really relaxing oil um, and can be, you can find lots of room sprays or bed sheet sprays that have lavender and some of these essential oils in them. Uh, taste, back to our earlier slide where we're talking about making a warm, soothing drink before bedtime like a tea. Um, I, I find the ritual of making a cup of tea something that's very relaxing. I probably enjoy it maybe even more than I do the cup of tea, but the fact that I'm boiling water, I'm using tea leaves, I'm steeping them, I'm straining them. I just find that ritual and the steps involved in it super relaxing. Uh, your bed should be comfortable. You know, the sheets should be comfortable on your skin. Uh, the mattress should be really comfortable. If it isn't, you know, you can go buy a mattress cover, a two inch cover. We've done that on ours. Um, so that when we first lie down, the mattress has great support, but when you first lie on it, it's kind of a big ah, right? Because it's just like, oh, wow, this feels great. And I'm, I really love it that we've added that to our uh, mattress. Um, low lights, no clocks or picture frames. Um, when I, I used to travel heavily for business and you would not believe the lengths I have gone to to darken a hotel room. I have stuffed towels at the top of the curtain where light is bleeding in from the street. I've stuffed them under the door where light is coming in from the hall. I've unplugged the alarm clock. Uh, you know, I've just done all kinds of things to make the room as dark as it can possibly be because I know that I need that. And it turns out our brain needs that as well. Um, white noise helps some people. It really doesn't bother me that there's a little white noise, but I don't necessarily have to have have it to fall asleep. Now, how we sleep uh, is an interesting thing as well. I've never been a stomach sleeper. I've never found it to be comfortable for me. Um, it can lead, as the slide says here, to back and neck pain because it's hard to keep your spine in a neutral position. It puts pressure on us. Uh, and, and this is suggesting if you are a stomach sleeper, try to prop your forehead on a pillow to keep your airway open. Um, 
uh, like on a massage table, right, where your head is hanging down and you have that opening instead of turning your head to one side. Well, I don't, my bed just simply won't do that. My pillows won't do that. I, I'm not and never going to be a stomach sleeper. Uh, I'm not often a back sleeper either, but this is supposed to be the best position in terms of keeping your spine straight and neutral. Uh, but I don't find it a position in which I fall asleep. I might roll over and be that way sometimes in my sleep during the night. I've never had a study, so I don't know, but I know I can't start out that way. Side sleepers, many of us are side sleepers. Most of us are side and fetal position, which is also side sleepers. Um, this is interesting, keep, keep an eye on this. Sleep on your left side if you are a side sleeper. Try to stay mostly on your left side. You're decreasing acid reflux based on where your organs settle in the body when you're on your left side. Um, also, uh, it's also uh, important um, if you're a fetal position sleeper to keep it on the left side. Now, this can result in a little bit more snoring. Um, and if you have a partner who maybe has a light case of apnea or snores a bit, uh, you know, you may find yourself nudging them. I did that for a few years before we finally got a sleep study for my husband and found out that he did have a mild case of apnea. So he has a special mouth guard that was made for him. He doesn't have to wear a CPAP machine, thankfully. But, um, you know, those are, those are things that uh, his snoring was impacting my ability to get a good night's sleep. And I just said, we've got to have you evaluated. Otherwise, I have to sleep in a different bed. I just can't sleep here with you because I'm not getting any sleep. So, um, so, you know, you have to work those things out. But uh, it turns out it was a health condition, and I'm glad that, that I was sort of adamant that we, we stay after it. Um, let's open it back up for a second and, and find out what kind of sleepers we have here. Do we have side or back or tummy sleepers? I'm definitely fetal, but I don't Fetals? sleep yep. on my left side. I sleep on the right, so I don't ah. know what that is. <laughs> you might, you might want to try that, Judith, and see if you can start to train yourself for more left side sleeping. Yes. I tend to sleep on my back, and it's very comfortable for my spine. Uh, any other position gives me uh, a backache when I wake up in the morning. Oh, that's great that you can do that, Marie. Yeah. I started sleeping, I always was a right, fetal right side sleeper, and when I got pregnant, I was informed <laughs> that it was healthier to sleep on your left side. And from that time mm -hmm. on, now I can do both. And it's almost like I prefer left because I've done it three times with the pregnancy. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, and due to the circulation. So, yeah. Yeah. So you were able to train yourself, huh? I, because of the pregnancies. But I loved my right side sleeping at one point. <laughs> <laughs> Josetta? Well, Josetta had a comment. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, most doctors don't really recommend the sleeping on your stomach. I know our daughter had carpal tunnel syndrome, carpal tunnel problems. You know, she had numbness in her hands and everything. And she said, the doctor said to me, and how do you sleep? And she said, on your stomach. And he put it, whatever. And she stopped it. And that was the end of that. No surgery, oh. no anything. So... Oh. And then I know that if I sleep on my side, I cannot sleep with one leg on top of the other and putting a pillow between it just doesn't work for me because it, if I have to get up to go to the bathroom, I, you know, I got to pull it out. Anyways, what works for me is to get my legs not on top of one another or else I get cramps in my leg and I can, it's so, I mean, it just happens all the time and I've been for studies and I have circulation good, but um, the doctor said, yeah, that's what you have to do. That is, that is what's going on. So I just toss that out in case somebody else, it helps somebody else. That's all. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you, Josetta. That's really interesting on the carpal tunnel. I have problems with that as well, uh, but I'm a side sleeper. I often wake up with my left hand, especially numb every morning and I have to shake it out. I can't even pick anything up. Um, I've got to go see a doctor about it. No, yeah. First of all, just go to the drugstore and get a real cheap wrist thing that'll keep your hands Yeah. And yep. then, I that's what one. I did. Mm -hmm. I did that like 20 years ago when I was using the computer, but it wasn't the computer. It was my sleeping habit. 
And once I got out of the habit of bending my wrist, yes, and that was the end of it. And an exercise ah. for um, corporal tunnel is bring your hands together like in a prayer and push them down very gently, just a little bit, and then bring them up again. That I think that was on Doctor Oz. Like ah, that. interesting. Yeah. Well, thanks for those Spread tips. Your wrist. The just, yeah, that's great. Okay, now my screen just changed. There we go. There it's back. So, um, so we did talk a moment ago about um, prescription sleep aids, and again, I I don't recommend them unless you know, um, you know, you really have a need for them. Very very short story. I was traveling to the Middle East many years ago for business, and I knew how many time zones I was going to be crossing, and that I just had to be able to work, and so I asked my doctor for Ambien. Uh, for the trip. I only wanted it for the trip. And I started taking it about seven days ahead of the trip. And then I took it throughout the trip. And it did help me regulate my sleep and get on a more regular cycle um, in spite of the jet lag. But I'll tell you what happened when I got home. I started trying to get off the Ambien and it was miserable. It was very, very difficult to get off of it, even though I was careful and reduced the dosage gradually. Um, I just, I didn't feel good. I didn't sleep good. It probably took oh my me two gosh. months before I felt normal from that. Oh, come on. Um, I I'm, just want to say that we're not having our screen sharing anymore. And it looks like Mary Ann got tied away to taken away. So just so you know that we're just seeing everything. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to say, cause I can't advance my slides. So I know right. that something there happened she is. here. Mary Ann, we need your help to put up the I would like to say that I drink warm milk, warm almond milk every night before I go to bed. And it is, for me, the best sleep aid. Um, I, I can't go to sleep without it. And I keep thinking, am I addicted to this almond milk? But it is the best sleep aid for me. It might not sound appetizing to some people, but I actually look forward to it. I've gotten used to drinking this warm almond milk. Well, Marie, you're a, you're a great lead in to this slide on herbal and natural remedies here because almonds are very high in magnesium. And magnesium, 30 minutes before bed, there you go. You're drinking your magnesium in the almond milk. So that's a great tip. I may try that because I actually use almond milk instead of cow's milk on my cereal. So I may give that a try at night. That sounds actually kind of appetizing to me. Can I just say, so, that when I do drink it though, I, I drink it just before I go to bed. I don't give myself time to stay awake after it. I drink it, brush my teeth, and then just get in bed, and I'm asleep almost immediately. If I wait yeah. too long, I seem to work, but I have to yeah. just before I get into bed. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you. Um, so some of the foods that are bad for our sleep are things like chocolate. Again, chocolate also has caffeine in it. Steak. Now, the reason steak is bad, the reason steak is sitting up here instead of chicken or fish or something else, is that red meat is the most difficult food for our stomach to digest. It has to work the hardest to digest red meat. So steak before bed, a big old steak dinner at uh, 8.30 at night, and then you go to bed at 10, is, uh, is going to do you in because your stomach and your organs are having to work so hard to digest that, that it's uh, going to inter interfere and prevent you from having a great night's sleep. So either eat it earlier and be sure you get that good three or four hour break before bedtime or, you know, reconsider your, uh, your red meat. Um, also chili, kind of the same thing plus, right? Chili also has beans. Beans are a gassy, gas-causing food, as are broccoli and cauliflower. So about the last thing you want to do is, is throw that food in your stomach have it starting its way down your intestine as you're trying to lie down and go to sleep. So, um, so those are some foods that are, are going to impact on us uh, physiologically and prevent us from being as relaxed as we possibly could be for sleep. Uh, we already talked a little bit about the almonds, but other things that are good and are natural are melatonin. Walnuts are also good. That um, herbal tea, no caffeine in it, right? Uh, milk. The um, magnesium and the almond milk, I think, is a great recommendation. Aromatherapy and white noise. 
And again, you do want to be careful with prescriptions and over-the-counter remedies because uh, some of those drugs are very addictive and very difficult to get back off of. I had a girlfriend who took Ambien for years and completely unbeknownst to her, she would get up in the middle of the night, get on her computer and buy things. And she had no recollection of it the next day. I just, you know, it was, it was crazy. And then um, maybe you can hear the snore on this one. That sounds like a contented individual having a good night's sleep. And hopefully his partner isn't being too uh, disturbed or her partner, depending on who's doing the snoring, right? right. Waves are a great white noise sound and you can buy little white noise machines uh, for your bedrooms. I like this one and, and whenever we, we do a lake or a beach vacation, I always try to open all the windows so that we can have the benefit of that sound. And with that, um, we are through the material today. Okay. Well, I have to make a quick comment. Um, we actually have another Zoom starting. So, yeah. So, um, I'm going to have to say goodbye to everybody because it's my boss's Zoom. So. <laughs> but, um, so, what I would like to do is I think that normally I would love to spend like 15, 20 minutes just talking about this. So Rhonda, what do you think about if people send in their questions? I think we could kind of do a back and forth with everybody. I'm going to do an email to everybody. And if, if people have more questions for Rhonda or want to make comments, you can reply to all and everybody will get them. That'd be great. I'd love, I'd be good. happy to help out with that. That sounds really good. Okay, fantastic. Well, I want to okay. thank Hap again, Christine, Nicole. Thank you, everybody, for sharing this time with us. Thank you, Rhonda. I could listen to you. You did not put us to sleep. I could listen to you <laughs> for, for hours and hours and hours. So I cannot wait till next month when we learn about making memories. Great. Something thank nice. you, everybody. All right. Don't thank forget you, Marianne. To your thank you, Nicole. Hap. I put their okay. links on your last email. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.